Hello and welcome to this talk on Agile Software Engineering for Legacy Code. And what I want to be talking about is how do we apply these Agile development techniques like unit testing, test isolation, and so forth in the context of legacy code of a, maybe a huge existing system. So one question, of course, is uh, what do you do for the old code? How can you write new code and well and still connect it in a nice way? And what are the practical difficulties? And um, this topic really has, has two main parts. And I want to start with a quote from uh, Gerard Messaros. He wrote this famous book about X-unit test patterns, uh, one of the, the gurus in the field. If the automated tests are good, the product code is probably good enough. If the tests are bad or missing, then all hope is lost. So if you have no automation coverage in uh, legacy code in an old big system or something, um, then the question is, you know, how do you, how do you get it and what is the right way to do it? And so this question of uh, ASE and legacy code has two parts. One is high-level strategy, and I'll, that's what this video is about. And the second video will be about code-level patterns, where really it's about how to handle which case uh, that you can uh, you know, run into so the, the 10 most, uh, most important patterns on how to deal with certain situations. So now we'll start with the high-level strategy. And that is really a, very, a question of um, why and where to invest. So if you have a huge system of millions of lines of code, it doesn't make sense to start with unit tests everywhere. Uh, you have to be very, be smart about where to invest and what to do. What are the basic approaches to, to go about it? Um, and then the key, I believe, is acceptance tests for the component level. Uh, I'll talk about what that means and how to do it. And then finally, how do you develop new code on an island? So if you do major extensions or uh, maybe you do a rewrite even of a component, how you can do it in a nice way and get all the benefits of the ASE techniques and still be able to be tightly integrated with a code base that doesn't, you know, wasn't written initially to help you doing this. So first question is why and where do we invest into test automation for legacy code? And you really have to basically say um, the, the main goal is to is development efficiency, to save effort. That is the main thing. So it's really in the end a business goal that that drives what you do. And you may feel like this truck burned down with many things, a bug fix effort and whatever slows you down. And it's wherever automation can help to alleviate this, this is what we should focus on first. And of course, on, on things that have immediate return on investment. So some topics that may be relevant to you that, um, that should define where to invest in, in test automation and legacy code and how to do it, we'll come to later is first of all, reduce all manual test effort. So that is an immediate return you get. Another thing is for maybe a critical business module that has little test coverage. So something that is really core to, uh, to the application. If you get wrong numbers out of there, um, maybe you don't make money anymore or whatever, that you wanna make sure that it works. So it is a risk issue. Uh, another thing is could be that you have um, a defect hotspot um, and that things, one module gives you constantly trouble and you think, okay, now I got to do some major refactoring. I have to clean it up. In order to do this, well, you have to have tests so to safeguard what the behavior is so you don't accidentally uh, destroy the behavior in this refactoring. Or you just have uh, too many bugs, too high analysis and bug fix effort. That is also an, an, um, an, an effort thing. So the maintenance load that is often... For some products, it can be as high as 50% and higher. If you can get that down, that goes, of course, into your ability to deliver new features. And finally, the technical debt, that's a separate topic that is covered in another talk, but technical debt is slowing down development, which means that the software is in a bad shape and you, do, you cannot dare to, uh, to clean it up because you don't, don't have automated tests. So it's hard to do anything in there. It's hard to fix bugs. It's hard to build anything on top. You have to be smart about how do I create a layer that I can have a good foundation for continued development. Basically, your system, your code base is the value of the product. It is many years, meaning uh, millions and millions of euros invested into the code base, and you, you got to take care of it. So this, again, the business reasons is what matters. And um, another big group could be of issues or things that drive you is that... Um, you want to deliver more features in the cloud and for cloud products and of course in shorter cycles. So you cannot say I'm, I have three months delivery cycles in a cloud if you want to deliver features faster, um, have short feedback cycles, use user feedback at all in your design, then you should be talking about weeks. Also, if you want to fix uh, bugs 
and you have a, a, a bottleneck in the cloud, you know, a performance bottleneck, for instance, you don't want to wait till the next release, you want to fix it now. And in order to do that, you need automated test coverage to ensure that your application still works. So also that can be a driver to say, how can I have this huge code base? How can I cover it uh, so that I can dare to do this and ensure that I don't have regressions? So the bottom line is investment follows business need. Now there's two basic approaches to do it. Uh, inside out and outside in. Uh, the inside out thing is um, basically everything you touch for every enhancement and fix, you put a test around, you add testability around, meaning that um, instead of having to test the whole system together as it typically is, when the system is not written for testability and isolation, um, you everything where you change, you create a little island basically and say, okay, now I can test this thing in isolation. But the trouble is, um, that of course this is effort. Now when this goes would go well, then you have basically little islands that grow and they grow together somehow and then in the end they cover um, uh, cover more of the system, but the trouble is it follows no plan. And the other trouble is that it's expensive too. So every, we have to figure out basically every border, every circle or box or whatever, every borderline you're drawing is work because you have to cut dependencies and control them to be able to test an isolation. And the more borderline you draw, the more effort you have to cover this volume. So outside-in is a different uh, approach <coughs> where you identify larger components like pricing, billing, you know, master data, whatever, and it has a bunch, lots of functionality, of course, in those models, uh, modules. You prioritize them, what's more important for business reasons, things I mentioned earlier. Then you decide from the top down, okay, this is what I'm going to tackle, this is my business goal for this component and then you do what is needed. Now, what is needed anyway to, be, to do any test is um, you have to isolate them and cover them with tests. So meaning you have to make sure you can test them in isolation without the whole system around it. And if you do this, then at least writing a new test on this level, on the component level, uh, becomes cheap and it's easier to add a new test in this level. So it's good once you've done that, it will be easy, for instance, if you make a change within that component to add a new test case on that level. And it's important to have those points where it's cheap to add a test case and not everybody has to start from scratch and build uh, you know, environment and do all the isolation because then it just doesn't happen. So um, it's best to use both in combination, but basically the, um, the main thing is you have the strategic investment, you have to go the component way and for non-trivial bug fixes and enhancements, you can go the inside out way. Now, what are component level automated acceptance tests, AATs? The idea behind it is that you have a component, and this is much more than a class or a few functions. This is really a big thing like billing, for instance. Um, you want to test this whole thing in isolation, but even it depends on other things. This component depends on other things that we call docs dependent on components like, um, I don't know, other side components, like you want to be able to send a mail or you have to ask, like from the billing, you have to go into the product database or something like that. Um, and you want to basically test this component with as little dependencies to the outside world as possible. Now, what are good automated acceptance tests? They test key features of a whole component. So the API that is available at the top level there uh, that's what you go through. It's not, a, it's not an inside unit test that tests a little piece only. It, I'm talking about something that addresses the public API of this whole component, the, the features that it offers. And um, so you test the key features of the whole component. These tests are written in the terms of semantic API at the component level. So they, they have things like billing, like customer, like whatever in it. And this is the focus of the test, not something technical on a low level. They typically, when, it's, when they're written well, and we'll look at an example uh, in the other um, <coughs> presentation, it can be read by the PO, by the product owner. So the, when they're written well, you have a few lines. It shows what the steps are, what goes in, what is the action, what is supposed to be checked at the end as a result. And the component is isolated from other components as much as possible. And it can run with or without the database. So this isolation against the database that you want in unit test is not important so much in the automated acceptance test. They can be slower and also they can rely on a fixed um, set of test data that you have in the database. So if you have a, a code that generates test data that you need for your whole automated test suite, 
then you would also do this for the component. So the component, what it needs for its test, you would have a piece of code that generates the test data in the database that this component needs. And so every component that you address has test data generation if needed, <coughs> the tests that it uh, against the public API that cover the whole component. Now, how can you write and evolve them? Um, you start with isolating the component from unwanted dependencies. So some things like database is okay, um, but other things you may want to get rid of. Everything that has external communication like to another system, dependency on master data somewhere else and so forth. Then you write tests against the public uh, component API. And then what's very important is step number three. If you look at those tests, often they're very long um, and you have to do all kinds of things and then um, you know, like prepare the action and maybe you have 10 calls to do something because that's just the way the public API works. Logically, it's one step though. And if you see, if you look at the tests and you see code repeating itself, you have to isolate them and refactor, not isolate the code, refactor the code so that you uh, create a helper class so that everything that repeats itself is a method in a helper class. And so if instead of having the 10 lines that does something, you have one line in the helper class, one method that says, you know, set up this case. And um, <coughs> when you do this right, then you will have very readable code and it's again very easy um, to write another case because the logical elements of what, um, what steps and preparations and actions make sense on this, uh, on this level, they will evolve by refactoring into the helper class. And so this test helper makes writing additional tests cheap on this level and this is very important. It becomes like a uh, domain specific language for the API where you can say uh, you basically can speak almost in this in in terms of uh, of this component. I want to show you a good example of this from uh, master data governance. This is one ex uh, component acceptance test. What this example does basically in master data, you have uh, things that is data that is changing over time. So you have to say you make a change, and this change is supposed to be active starting at this date from this date and then other changes are changing, uh, other things are changing at different times, and you want to make sure that they don't influence each other if they're not supposed to. And so this is a little test that um, makes two changes, and you want to ch check on the cross-reading rule. But basically, if you look at this um, logical steps, the boxes, you create a change request. And if you look at the second box, and you change in attributes, you save the change request, you create another one on a, on a different uh, table or on a different object type. You change another attribute and you save the change request and then you do assertions on them. So you can see that each step in preparation is just one call and you can use these methods in, in many more um, tests that you write. This is a very important thing and uh, it kind of follows the given when then pattern. So given is like the initial context, create and generate the, like the data setup. When is the action, when I do this, and when I do this, then I want to check that the right thing happened. Now, how do you get code component coverage cheap? If you have a big component with little coverage, it is really the question, how can I get useful coverage um, in a reasonably efficient way? Because if you start bottom up with unit tests, it's way too expensive to cover something like 100,000 lines of code or even 10,000 lines. And so you have a, if you have a component with little coverage and complex method with many interacting arguments, so either arguments directly in the, in the call or in the environment or in the master data or whatever you have that can impacts the behavior of this code, um, then you uh, may need to, either you know what it's supposed to do and then you can, uh, um, you can basically challenge the code and write, this is supposed to happen in this case. Or if you don't know what it's supposed to do, for instance, if you start a refactoring, you don't even know the code, it's 10 years old, written by somebody else. You have to measure the existing behavior and that's called a characterization test. So in both cases, you want a good coverage of the code um, in, 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 yeah, in a reasonable way and in a cheap way, of course. Uh, there is a method called all pairs test design. Basically, what you do there is you define, let's say you do one call and it has uh, a few parameters. It defines a model of the parameters and the possible values and a tool generates the so-called pair coverage for those parameter combinations. So if you basically cement, it systematically 
uh, covers creates a set of test cases that is the minimal set of pair coverage cases um, that give you very good code coverage. And basically what it does, it, it combines things that could interact with each other uh, into test cases so you can see if this combination works or that combination works. And um, so especially on the if you want to cover existing code, this method is something to look at and it's also what is um, covered in the AC course, but also we have separate videos for that. So you see a, a link there to uh, the test design method videos and tools you can download and you, you can see how to, how to apply this. Now the good news is here, if you do this right, then you usually get 80% coverage of the code and you find 70 to 90% of possible bugs. Now, where does this come from? This is an empirical evidence. Studies have been done with different types of applications, even by NASA um, and other um, big you know, organizations. Does it method work and how does it work in different cases and different types of applications? So it's really, there's a lot of evidence that this uh, has a good effect. And so again, if you have this case, it's worth to look at. Now, the final question was, how do you develop new code in the context of a legacy application. What do I, if I have to add new features or do a rewrite in a legacy application? And what to do there, you can, it basically it, it shows in uh, this little example there in the drawing on the left-hand side. What you really, let's say what you write new is the code in the class X. So this is a new, uh, a new box that you write completely new and it's called the Sprout class pattern. So basically, you, um, you graft in a new class into an old code, into an old tree, so to speak. Then this new code, if you drive it through test-driven development, you can find, develop it just fine through local tests, unit tests that are right next to the code, in this case, little box A. You go through the public API of this component in this class or whatever that is, and this is how you can develop. So when you develop the new features, you're just concerned with A and X. And of course, X depends on something, so maybe you find it, on the way, or maybe when you do re rewrite, you, you, you see it when you analyze the code. Of course, you have to isolate the dependent on the components so that you can uh, test X in isolation. And so you do all that, then X is tested, and you are sure that the behavior of X is covered uh, with good unit test coverage. And now you can hook up X into the context, meaning the red bars, you, uh, you don't put the test doubles in there, you take them away, and so now X really goes together with the uh, um, with the, with the lower level functions, whatever it calls. And then you go to the integration test that's called, and you see on the top there on the B. So the integration tests, they go of course through the system, they get to the component X and they use the lower level components, whatever's underneath. So they go through the whole stack and you need a few of those to verify that the flow works, that the connections to the environment work and so forth, that you can actually call X, you get to it. But you wouldn't, ever re replicate the coverage and the combinations and cases and everything that the, the thoroughness that you did in the test uh, for A, you wouldn't replicate at B. So B is totally uh, focused on just the flows, a few key cases, edge cases, if you will. And this allows you to develop big new features in legacy code context, get all the benefits of, um, of uh, agile software engineering in your development, which is an immediate return. And also the new code, it makes your code base better because X will be in better shape and you have local tests for it. And if you do major changes in different places, so you will have several of these islands that are better code. And this is the way to do that. So this is the end of um, the talk on the high level approach. And the next video is gonna talk about um, how to use ASE techniques in, on the code level.